Hey everybody, how you doing? My name is James Hagedorn. I'm the Curator of Geology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And right now I'm beaming to you live from my living room to talk to you about some really amazing and actually kind of unknown fossils from our collection. These fossils um, have actually, been, of course, been around for millions of years, but we really just discovered some new things about them. And I wanted to share a little bit of that story with you today because science is an evolving process. In fact, science is actually a verb. So to get going here, I wanna share some really cool images of fossils with you, just kind of take you on a virtual field trip through some of our collections. And maybe we can together come up with some ideas about how these fossils form and why they're so unusual and why they're important. So looking forward to journeying with you. Give me just a second here. I'm gonna share my screen and show you some pictures. So um, this project kind of started uh, by accident a few years ago when, uh, Frank Krell, who's our curator of zoology, uh, one of our curators of zoology at the, at the museum, he and I were going through the collections and trying to figure out and identify all the different fossilized insects from about 50 million years ago that were in our collections. And we had drawers and drawers of these things. And Frank was amazing because he went through them and he had his hand lens and looked at them and identified them. And, and we got reached out to other colleagues that helped us with those. And he came over to me one day and he brought this specimen here, this little lace wing. And Frank's a German guy and he comes over and says, Oh, this is very interesting. Ah, oh, so cool. Look at the wing pattern on this venation on this lace wing. So I walked over and looked at it and pulled out my little hand lens and said, oh my God, Frank, you're right. This is incredible. It's not only a really cool insect, but look how it's preserved. This is a picture of the fossil that you're looking at right here. This white, um, beautiful kind of feather-like um, fossil um, with amazing venation in its wings. It's, it's not brown. It's not black. It's not gray like so many other fossils that we see out there. And up here on the upper right in the screen is actually one of those little uh, feather-like um, seed, seed, um, seeds that, are, that we see sometimes blowing in the wind uh, in the spring. And I thought, oh my gosh, these things are preserved. Like they're almost like some kind of a white dust on the rock. Here's another picture of one. Here's a bee, oh my God. Bzzz. This is a fossilized bee from the Green River Formation, a rock unit that's exposed here in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, and is super famous. And here's a bee where its wings are preserved as kind of this white dust-like mineral, but its body, you can see the actual stripes on it and, and the other uh, sort of more characteristic darker color patterns that, that occur when you squash a, a bug into sediment and then later on, millions of years later, turn it into a rock. Um, it turns out that this type of weird kind of whitish colored preservation, which we're kind of calling ghost preservation because it looks like a ghost, um, is all over the place. And it, some specimens, um, here's a rock uh, with, that has soft flies on it. Some of them right here, if you can see my mouse, are um, darker in color as one would normally expect for a fossil this age. Whereas others, if you look up here in the right, upper right corner, there's a bunch of wings that are, that are completely ghosted. And so when we went through the collections, we started realizing that this is kind of a rare and actually a new way of preserving fossils that of course has been around for millions of years, but as scientists, we've never recognized before. And we have the evidence right underfoot in our own collections. So kudos to Frank for helping us look through these collections and for all the partners at local museums and other institutions that have helped us kind of assemble a story of these. And so I wanna just show you that this type of preservation isn't necessarily restricted to just one kind of fossil. And in fact, here's an example in the lower left of a damselfly wing, one of which is preserved in ghost preservation. The other of which, the left of it, is preserved with its actual cuticle or the sort of mineralized bits left over from the wing in the rock. Um, here's a example of a, a crane fly on the right from Florissant, which is just down near uh, Colorado's, west of Colorado Springs. Here's a crane fly on the left that's completely ghosted. Here's a spider where, who knows, maybe this is like one of those Marvel superhero movies where they get half transported into one realm and the other, but the bottom half of this spider on the lower right is completely ghosted, but the upper parts are still preserved as one might expect a normal everyday fossil. Wow. Well, we were really curious to figure out how this uh, preservation happened because oftentimes when you see fossils or minerals or other structures in a rock, it's kind of like a clue that you might find at a detective scene. And sometimes the detective doesn't know exactly what the clue is telling them the first time they find it. They just know that it's kind of out of the ordinary. And so we're working, we're working in deep time with rocks. We use the same approach and we found this clue again and again. And we've been trying to figure out what, what does it exactly tell us about these ancient environments and how our planet has evolved. 
So we took a bunch of samples of these and here's an example, by the way, of leaves. So it isn't just animals that have, this happens to. Here's a leaf that's been ghosted right here in the middle. But yet right next to it is a leaf that's preserved just as you might expect a, a leaf that got squashed in a rock and turned into what's called a compression fossil. So we took a bunch of samples of these and we started uh, analyzing them in a scanning electron microscope, which is a really neat instrument that uses um, uh, electrons to basically bombard samples and um, look at how those samples compositions responds in different wavelengths of what you can think of as light. And uh, one of the nice things about using SEM and various instruments attached to it is that you can examine fossils without actually having to destroy them or cut them or so forth. And some of these fossils are pretty rare. So um, we, we try to use that approach to analyze what was the chemistry and the mineralogy of these fossils? Like, what are they actually composed of? What's that white stuff that we're seeing? And so this is an example of a sample that we analyzed right here. And you can see the venation of the wing. This is an inset image of where that wing was. And we put this sample in the SEM. And this was the very first one we did. You guys ready to find out what we've learned? So this is an element map. So all of the colors that you see on the screen here are basically a map of the distribution of a particular type of element, in this case, carbon, that was present in this area imaged on the screen right here. And the image I'm showing you right now, you're wondering, well, where is all the color? It's because there isn't any color in here. We were really surprised there's no carbon. And then we looked at another element. We looked at iron, there's no iron, there's no sulfur. We started looking for element after element, and we finally looked at uh, manganese. And manganese is lit up on the screen here. And I hope you can see that the purple here is kind of outlining the venation of the wings. This is exactly the same area that I imaged in the previous, uh, previous images for those other elements. And where this slide shows purple, that's where there's a lot more manganese present in the fossil, in this case, in the veins, in the wing of that lace wing. And so we did this with a whole bunch of different elements, um, which are the sort of basic building blocks of our bodies and life and, and also fossils and, and organic structures. And we put these things together and realized that, oh my gosh, these fossils in some cases are preserved as these really weird manganese oxide minerals, which might be manganite, burnicite, pyrolusite. I know, we gotta say that three times fast. Those are weird names. But you have seen these minerals too. If you've ever seen any split stones or maybe on the sidewalks of Denver and seen these things called dendrites, these sort of fern looking uh, patterns that you see on the rock, these are some of the same types of minerals. But rather than growing in cracks in a rock, they're replacing, in this case, the incredibly small, very delicate veins in the, in the wings of this particular insect. And all of these fossils are preserved almost in the same way. And that to us was mind blowing because no one had ever recognized that before. So we, went, we did this with a bunch of specimens. We actually went back and looked in the collections and sure enough, here's another wing. Here's a wing of a damselfly. And you can actually see in places along the top of the wing here where the damselfly is black, almost like someone took pencil lead and, and drew along it. And then down here in the bottom, here's an example where the venation of the wing is really sharp. Yeah. And then in the between these sort of white blotches, white, uh, uh, patterns or ghosted parts of the wing here, you can see the different gray scale or gray colored blotches. And we think that this is actually um, one of these manganese oxides like pyrolusite that's actually replacing the wing. And if you look at the white patterns in here where the, where the uh, ghost fossil has been ghosted, one of the things that you'll see is that it's actually a little bit blotchy. Like look at this big blotchy area here. And over here, you'll see that there are little blotches here and there. Well, it turns out that manganese oxides, in addition to being types of minerals that form naturally in nature, are actually used as industrial bleaching agents. And those bleaching agents, in this case, we think have actually bleached the rock. And so one of the fun things about this is that uh, what we're actually looking at is a ghost. It's a bleach mark of a fossil in a rock. And so what to me was absolutely mind blowing is that these fossils are not actually fossils that are mineralized. They're the absence of a fossil. They're where a mineralized fossil used to be. And where that fossil may have bleached the rock, been mineralized. And then as the mineral that replaced the fossil dissolved, maybe as waters percolated through the rock, that that actually 
um, turn that mineral, if you will, into kind of a, a miniature version of the bleach that you might put in your, your laundry, for example, and actually remove the color from the rock. And this was kind of a remarkable thing because it says, oh my gosh, that's a process that we, we just haven't seen before in the rock record and certainly not associated with fossils. And so if we look at these images here on this slide, this is a little bit of a, this is an ant right here. Here's a stick. Here's a fossil that's been um, ghosted. And this ghosted fossil, if you notice, has a little bit of a jagged margin to it. There's one uh, up here in the top. You see it also has a jagged margin, this leaf. And we think that's where some of this these manganese oxides might have leached out and actually bleached the rock, or maybe they came in from a crack. And so it turns out that we're not the only people to recognize this, that others, once we started talking to folks in the community, found these things again and again in their collections. So here's an example of some leaves from South America from a completely different deposit, but that's kind of the same age as the ones here in Colorado. And we've got a leaf that's been completely bleached. And in the middle, you can see this kind of, um, iron rusty looking stain in the middle. We think this is where the, the sort of last remnants, if you will, of the mineralized fossil uh, still exist. Um, and it's just incredible to actually see these fossils. Look at the veins in here. I mean, we're preserving like almost cellular le level soft tissues. And what's really mind blowing is we're preserving them as nothing at all. They're ghosts. So one of the things that um, I wanted to show you is that we're not the only ones in the world to find this. This is a crazy table with lots of words on it. But the point is, is that this is a list of all of the known fossil deposits and environments that contain this kind of ghosted preservation. And it turns out that this type of ghosted preservation or ghost preservation, no matter how spooky it may sound or may not be, has been around for about 300 million years, going all the way back to the Carboniferous period. And it affects insects, leaves, beetles, moths, spiders, even fish in some cases. And almost all of these deposits are fossilized lake deposits. And so there's something about fossilized lakes or maybe freshwater estuaries and the like that, um, that we've, we've been missing out in terms of its evolutionary and sort of geologic history. And some of the clues to that might be in the way that the fossils are actually preserved, not in just the fossils themselves and what they are. And what was really cool to see is a couple of years ago, um, folks were studying um, some um, seed ferns uh, in Australia. And it seems they may have caught this ghost preservation in the act. And so here's an example of a seed fern with these manganese oxides kind of at the bottom of it in the bottom left of this larger scale image and then the ghosted parts in the upper right. And they went through the same process we did here at the Denver Museum, looking at these with scanning electron microscopes and the colors that you see at the right represent the different elements that were the building blocks of these specific minerals, or in that case, where they're absent, the absence of minerals. So here I have hopefully brought you a new type of fossil preservation that's, that's new to us and new to the community. And what's really interesting is it's really the preservation of nothing. But the question is, what does that tell us about deep time and deep earth? And I guess I'm gonna to have to say, stay tuned because we're still in the process of figuring this out, but I hope this has been a fun little fossil journey for you. And um, to me, it illustrates the fact that museum collections are super important because we have amazing fossils in our collections, but in some cases haven't had the tools to be able to figure them out until very recently. And this is one example of those right here. Thanks. Thank you, James. That was a really fascinating presentation. It was really incredible. I uh, I should introduce myself. My name is Jose Zuniga. I'm a uh, educator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and we always love to learn at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. People have great questions. I see that I'm very green, so I'm going to try restarting my camera here. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe you're in the process of being ghosted, Jose. <laughs> maybe I am. So, some weird manganese is getting into my camera. That's what's, uh, <laughs> see if that fixes the problem there. So we do have, uh, I'm still green. I think it's just, you know, just, I'm lucky. That's what I'm gonna take it as, lucky. Uh, <laughs> we do have some questions that have come in from some of uh, the folks that have tuned in with us today. One of the questions that I see here is, uh, do ghosts, ghosts, uh, show up in the fossil record as rock stained in other ways, or are they all this bleaching sort of process? That's a great question. And the short version is we don't know, because I don't think people have looked. 
So there are lots of fossils that are preserved as stains in the rock record, but um, usually those stains are accompanied by some kind of mineralization, like the preservation of uh, like um, a carbonaceous film, which is kind of like a, a thin film of coal, or they're preserved as a as a film of iron, like you might look at, like in a rusted looking specimen. But um, this this sort of absence of preservation or removal of color is something that we haven't seen before. But I think if people looked, we might have something to learn from that. And as an example, in recent years, we've learned that um, we've been able to try to figure out the color of feathers and dinosaurs and other things like that. And the way we figured it out is not because the color is preserved in the rock, but because the mineralogical residues left behind the what's called structure of color, right? The little bits and pieces of fossilized mineral that get oriented um, in the rock or in that film, um, we can read those just like a UPC symbol at the checkout of the grocery store, and we can decode the color from ancient rocks. Even though the, the fossil might not be red and green and purple and, and, and blue, it might have the sort of message of those colors encoded in those, in those, in those uh, textures, right? And you can only see them at the microscopic scale, typically with a scanning electron microscope. And so we, we I, I think the community, that's a great question, and the community should go look for these things and see what we can learn from them. That's really interesting. I, things that never would have occurred to me as somebody who doesn't immerse myself deeply in geology and paleontology as you do, James. Uh, we got another question here uh, coming in that says, does this ghosting process occur in any porous rocks? Uh, what type of rocks are they? Are they all mudstones? Are they all sandstone? What, what type of rocks can this happen in? That's a great question too. Uh, it turns out these are almost all in rocks uh, called shales or mudstones. Um, and many of them are, are in lakes or let's say estuaries or bays that are near the coast that also tend to have a lot of volcanic input into them from volcanic ash. If you think of Mount St. Helens or Mount Pinatubo or something like that. So there may be an element of, um, of the rock type that's influencing this. Um, but it's hard to know at this point. Sandstones are, as you mentioned, very porous and can allow lots of fluids to, to move through. But on the other hand, sandstones tend to be fairly coarse in their grain sizes. They're kind of rough and um, they tend to require higher energy to be deposited. And if you think about a delicate um, bee wing or a flower, those would tend to get ripped apart and maybe not preserved as easily um, in those coarser kind of sandier rocks that might be more porous as they would be in sort of, let's say a, a lake or a pond where, you know, the leaf could settle down from the surface and kind of quietly, gently rest in the mud and then get buried, right? Um, without being torn apart. Cause I don't know if you've ever tried to pick up a wet old leaf in the forest before, but it's like picking up wet toilet paper. It just shreds in your hands, right? So um, great question. That is a great question. Uh, we had a, uh, one of our uh, viewers note that they find a lot of sandworms and seashells uh, fossils on uh, on their dad's property, and they noticed that some of the sandworms that they found are whole, not flat fossils. They they have dimensionality. So uh, why is that versus other flat fossils? Why do some fossils have dimensionality, and why do some get flat? Great question. Well, it comes down to being compressed, right? So sediments. Um, um, are deposited and they might be coming out of a delta or they might be in a mudslide. Uh, it depends on whether we're talking about an environment in the ocean or an environment on, on land. But you know, at the end, the first thing for something to get fossilized, it has to be buried, right? And then those those sediments that it gets buried in uh, can get compressed, you know, as they get buried deeper and deeper. And oftentimes waters and fluids will kind of get out of there and, and it'll become denser and denser and denser until eventually it becomes a rock. Um, other things can happen to it after that. But um, if um, you're in a setting where you have burial that happens very quickly, you're more likely to preserve a fossil like this. And it, the other way that, uh, or, or certainly to preserve a fossil that's three-dimensional still and hasn't been squished as much. The other way to preserve a fossil that's three-dimensional, which is kind of a uh, a little industry secret is that you, you can mineralize it really early. So while those sediments on the, on the sea floor, the lake bottom, if this is the lake bottom and you've got a worm tube, you know, it's doing that in there and, 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 and then it dies. 
um, if you can somehow mineralize the tube that it was in, or if it was an arthropod, you know, the tube or the dwelling burrow that it was living in, um, if you can mineralize that early, maybe by fluids coming in and, and interacting with the digestive juices or the poop or whatever, sometimes you can actually harden it enough such that when it later undergoes compression, it doesn't get squished. And in places like reefs, uh, in the marine setting, that happens super quickly. Things get cemented like in a day sometimes. I mean, it really depends, but things can happen by a geologic time scale super fast. But in other settings that might be muddier, sometimes the actual burrow itself or the, or the critter decomposing actually helps it to mineralize. And you can even sometimes form like a kind of like a fossilized tumor around it, which makes it hard and, and, and inhibits it from being compacted. And that gives it the three dimensionality. That's so interesting. And you know, these processes for forming fossils, they seem so very complex. And we find so many different fossils, but it also seems like they need very specific conditions, like this ghosting process. You say you're discovering that there's an association with lakes and fresh water, certain types of rocks are required. Thinking about the diversity of life on Earth, there are creatures that live very far from lakes. Are those sort of blind spots that we have in the fossil record? Um, or can the fossils we find in these conditions help inform us of what life is like away from these environments? Yes and yes. Um, so the thing about the fossil record is we're not quite, you know, flying blind, but we're we're like that, right? And we have to look at the filter of the fossil record through um, all of the natural processes that remove organisms and decay things and break them down um, to see what's left. And you know, some people will say that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of of all creatures that ever lived are dead, and that's true. But and even, you know, 99.9999999% are never fossilized, right? They get decomposed, they get eaten, their bones get scavenged by, um, by, by um, insects, their um, tissues decay, right? They, um, you know, get incinerated, and so on and so forth. So most organisms, whether you're talking about a, a, a moss or a redwood tree or an elephant or a clam, don't get fossilized. Um, the hard parts, whether they be your teeth or your ear bones or a, a shell, are more likely to be fossilized than the others. Um, but that's a huge filter just on the input of, of biological information into a rock. And then on the other hand, geology is like doing terrible things to fossils all the time, right? We have volcanoes like basically cooking and incinerating them. We have mountains, you know forming through collision of continents and faults that are squishing them and squeezing them and hot fluids are percolating through. And so all these things are just terrible for fossil preservation in most cases. Um, and then once they get exposed on the surface, we have mother nature takes over again and we have weathering. We have the process of breakdown of rocks from snow and ice and wind and the roots of trees and trampling by wildebeests. And, and all those things are, are kind of providing filters on the back end to what we are actually able to see. And so, um, you know, one of the fun things about being a geologist is you are a detective in deep time. And when you're looking at fossils, you're trying to like either decode or see through all of those filters. And so understanding things like ghost preservation, that's like another filter that we realized we were blinded by. And if we can figure it out, we'll have a clearer view as to what these things are telling us. And if you think about like a hundred years ago, people didn't know what half those filters were. So they, they took a fossil from one place and a fossil from another, and they Put them together and they were even not even part of the same organism or the fossil was squished but they didn't realize it so they reconstructed the critter completely wrong incorrectly and and that's just the part of science is is you're making lots of small mistakes in order to move closer to the truth right yeah it's really incredible to think about just the sheer odds against something as delicate as a dragonfly wing being fossilized. And yet here we have these ghost fossils, this, this mineral bleaching process, leaving this incredible impression. And now with our technologies, uh, we can we have an opportunity to really enrich and deepen our understanding of, of, of ancient ecosystems. That's really incredible. I'm very jealous, James, you get to work on some pretty amazing uh, stuff. It's pretty uh, fun. <laughs> so. But hey, you know, I would reach out to the audience out there. If you ever see any weird types of fossil preservation like ghost pre preservation, please let us know because the, one of the great powers that we have the internet is our connectivity and our ability to communicate with others. And so um, 
when, as soon as we found this type of preservation in our own collections, we reached out to the community and said to everybody else, have you seen any of this? And people said, oh my gosh, I think I saw that in da 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 da, da place. And they reached out. So the great thing that we have that's an advantage in science isn't just the knowledge, but it's the ability to communicate. And so if the audience is out there, see anything that's interesting, please reach out to, to us or someone else uh, nearby and, and let us know. And, and we'd be happy to try to help. That is such a great thing to hear from you, James. And yes, absolutely true. We love to hear from folks about science. We also love to hear from you about how we're doing, how we are bringing science to you. So we have a survey link included in those comments there. We'd love to hear from you. James, I've really enjoyed hearing from you today. It's been absolutely fantastic to learn about this process. I'm super excited to see where this might lead us in the future. I want to say thank you uh, on behalf of everybody who tuned in. I really appreciate it. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up our Science Division Live for today. Thanks again, James. Thank you all for tuning in. We hope you all have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.